Pueblos Church, you may be seated. Good to see you guys. Man, this, this, this is always the awake service, you know, like 8 a.m. And those guys, they forget to drink their coffee and they're always kind of half asleep. 10 a.m., eh, not so menos, but 12 p.m., man, I got to give it to 12 p.m. I know this is the hungry service because some of you have, don't eat until after service, but for sure it's the awake service. I want to um, invite you to open up your Bibles to, to a couple of places. Um, we're going to, first of all, start off in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. So it's Matt, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're going to be in John, chapter 1. And then um, a few letters later, uh, John, Acts, Romans. We're going to be in Romans, chapter 8. And we'll spend some time in Romans. And then we're going to go to 1 John, chapter 3. Now, 1 John is different than St. John. So 1 John is close to the end of the Bible. And then we're going to finish this afternoon in Matthew, chapter 6. I want to encourage you when you come to Pueblo's Church, bring your Bible. I want to encourage you, maybe find a little notepad, um, you know, take, take some notes. Um, at the, toward the end of the teaching, I'm going to share with you eight different points, four points on one thing, four points on another. If you want, take a picture of it so you can think about it, pray about it, and, uh, and let God guide you. Um, as you're searching in your Bibles, um, I want to take a quick moment to uh, send a quick shout out to everybody that's watching us live or joining us through Radio Alleluia or uh, through social media or however you're joining us. Um, God bless you. We hope that one day you'll come and join us here at Pueblos Church. We meet every Sunday at 12 p.m. It's our English service here at the church. And we pray and we believe that today's message is going to be as big of a blessing for you that wherever you're at as we believe that uh, the message is going to be a blessing for us that are here live. Can somebody help me with an amen? Amen, amen. amen. Man, I tell you, for Pueblo's Church, you know, man, 10 a.m. is like the biggest service. I mean, it's packed, balcony, everything's packed. And to get an amen out of those people, don't tell them, but jeez, man, I'm like, really? I feel like I'm a dentist or something, right? Trying to get it. But now I'm just kidding. I know, I know some of your parents come to that service. Don't tell them I said that. It's all, it's all a joke. It's all in good fun, right? Well, we are in February. And um, I, I, I say February because I'm Texan. I guess some people say February. I don't know. But anyway, um, and Valentine's is coming up, right? And uh, I, I want to encourage all the wives that come to church and your husband doesn't come. Um, I want you to tell your husband, you know what? You don't need to buy me anything. That part's a lie. That part's not true, right? But you know, be like, you know, now the truth part is going to be, but I do want you to go to church with me, right? I want you to go to church with me this month. And, um, and so I want to encourage you to, to come to church. This month, I'm going to be teaching, maybe a little bit on marriage, maybe a little bit on family. I don't know. We'll see how the Lord guides us. Today, it's going to be about, um, I'm going to sort of concentrate on marriage, but really the real concentration is just overall on relationships, on how we see people, how we deal with people, how we forgive people, how to seek forgiveness and how to forgive because this, this is a big deal. This is a big deal for God. And when something is a big deal for God, it should be a big deal for us, right? If something is important to God, it should be important to us. And forgiveness is like extremely important to God, right? Extremely important to God. If you ever read the Old Testament, you'll read about all these sacrifices that they would do. They would do. All of that was just for forgiveness. Then God sends, he doesn't send a prophet, he doesn't send an angel, he sends his only begotten son, and Jesus came so that we would receive forgiveness. So forgiveness is a big deal to God, and, um, and God wants us to be imitators of him. God wants us to, to, to look like him, to walk in that path where we're looking more and more like God, right? You know, uh, I look at my daughters, at Rebecca Rose, Raquel Rose, Ruth Rose, uh, Rosalinda Rose, she's still baby, but Rebecca Rose, Raquel Ruth, Ruth Rose, you start seeing their personalities, and I'll tell you that, especially Rebecca and Raquel, man, they're funny. Like, they're funny. They, they're jokesters. They're pranksters. Um, they're, now they're making up, you know, jokes. You know, why, why did the chicken cross the road, right? You know, and I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, because all their kids were on the other side. I'm like, that, that's, that's pretty good, right? You know, like, they're making up their own jokes now. And every time they make us laugh, you know, I, I kind of like puff up my chest a little bit. And I'm like, man, they're just like their dad, right? They're just like their dad, right? But then, then, then all of a sudden they start fighting. And every time they're there fighting, I look at my wife. And I'm like, I'm not like that. You're not like that. I'm like, we need to figure this out. You know, like, where did that come from, right? You know, like, but uh, for the most part, right, that, 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 you know, like if a dad is, is a lawyer 
and his son tells him, dad, I'm going to law school and graduates from law school. Man, that dad, that day of graduation, he's like, that's my son, right? Like if a, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a mom knows how to cook and she cooks really well and, you know, one day her daughter like makes, you know, some enchiladas or, you know, I'm hungry, um, tacos or, you know, some, some um, I don't know, lasagna or something and it tastes really good. Man, the mom, she's calling grandma, she's calling her, the aunts, she's calling everybody like, hey, mija, cook today. It's really good. She, just like me, just like me. I, I didn't even have to help her, right? You did have to work, right? I didn't even have to help her, right? You know, like that, that's what parents are proud of that, right? Parents are proud of that. And let me tell you that your heavenly father is the same way, right? Your heavenly father is the same way. He wants to say, just like me, right? He wants to look at you, point at you and say, just like me. That's testimony, right? That's testifying. That's witnessing, that, that people would see that, hey, something's different in your life. You know, you started going to that church, something's different in your life. You started reading that book, something's different in your life. You started getting on your knees, something's different in your life. You started singing those songs, something's different in your life. And the world, the, you know, people outside, they may not understand it, but your heavenly father is looking and saying, just like dad, right? Just like dad. And so with this in mind as our foundation, as the basis of two message, of, of our message today, I want to share with you on, um, you know, a, a little bit on marriage, and then we're going to get into forgiveness. But all, all marriages, sooner or later, there's strife, right? All marriages, sooner or later, there's, 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 there's drama, there's issues. People get a little bit of upset. People get their feelings hurt. And, um, you know, sometimes we do things intentionally or unintentionally, and, and we bring harm to someone or, or, you know, or our spouse may bring harm to us. And, um, and when you're going through those situations and, and now we're dealing with forgiveness and you're like, yeah, pastor, but you don't understand. Uh, I, I need, pastor, I need to talk to you for an hour. No, you do not need to talk to me for an hour. All right. And, and I don't want to understand. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that my dad and I, we always say when my dad was pastor and then when I came in as pastor, we always say like, we don't do counseling, right? I have a master's in psychology, but I don't do counseling um, because 99% uh, of you are going to have the same answer and you're not going to like what the answer to your problems is, right? When you come and you're going to tell me, well, you know, he blankety blank, blank, blank. And then he's going to say, well, you know, she blankety blank, blank, blank. And then he, she's going to be like, well, yeah, but you know, he didn't tell you da, 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 da. And he's going going to be like, yeah, but she didn't tell you data, data, data. And I'm just like a ping pong, right? Between husband and wife. And then after about 45 minutes, I'm like, okay, guys, here, here's, here's the solution. You need to forgive him and you need to forgive her, right? That'll be $75 an hour, right? You know, like that. <laughs> y'all going to look at me like, oh, one of y'all is going to leave bothered, right? One of y'all is going to leave bothered because you want more. But you know what? That is, sometimes it's in the simple things, right? Sometimes it's in the simple things. However, sometimes the simple things are complicated, right? Especially when we're dealing with hearts and emotions and minds and brains and people and, you know, your cousin's so dramatic, you know, and all that type of stuff, right? So uh, I want to touch a little bit on this because the first thing that we have to understand, right? Those of you who are married and, and, and this, this is more geared toward marriage, but it could apply to many other things, um, many other relationships. But the first thing that we have to understand, we have to answer this question, all right? The question is, how does God see me? Right? How does God view me? If you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you have put your faith in the death and resurrection of the Lord, if you have believed that Jesus is the Son of God, you're what we call saved, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a Christian, not just in religion, but, but you're, you're a disciple of Jesus, you're living for Jesus, we have to answer the question, how does God see me? Right? When God sees me, how does God see me? Now, look at John chapter 1, verse 12. And from John chapter 1, we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who believed in him, speaking of Jesus, to all who believed in Jesus and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Right? When you confess Jesus as Lord, when, and that means that he's the master, the king, the ruler of your life. When you put your faith and your belief in his death and resurrection, when you believe that the son of God came to save us, you, you, you were given a right, right? You were given a right. And the right was to become a child of God, right? You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. The son of God came that we would become sons of God, right? Sons and daughters of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, 
says, and since we are his children, we are heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering, right? So as children of God, we are heirs, right? Uh, in, in Spanish, in the version that I use in Spanish, Reina Valera 60, 1960, it says, co It says, co-heirs. Now, uh, most of us here, we're Hispanic, and in our people, right, in our people, the, 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 there's, a, there's a disconnect that hasn't happened. You're going to be the one to change your, your, your family uh, tree, your family tree from here, right? But the disconnect is that very, very few have been given an inheritance, right? Very few people amongst us, um, you know, were given an inheritance, you know, from, from mom or dad or from our grandparents. Very, very few. The vast majority of us, that, that, that's not even a thought. You were given bills, right? You know, you, you were given debt, right? And you're like, what, what am I going to do with all of this, right? And, um, but you, you're going to leave your children an inheritance. Right. Uh, I caught you by surprise. Let me try that again. But you, you're going to leave your children an inheritance. Say Amen. Amen. All right. Amen means yes. Yes, I'm going to leave my children an inheritance. You, you're, going to, you're going to leave so much an inheritance, you're going to leave an inheritance for your grandchildren. Amen. 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 Some of you are like, no, nah, I'm not going to leave those greedy, not those little kids, nothing. Like, come on, man. Don't be like that. All right? So you, you're going to leave them an inheritance. Well, guess what? God, when he pulled you into the family, he made you a member of the family. He saw you as a son. He saw you as a daughter. He didn't just bring you into the family. He says, you know what? Here's an inheritance. Your co-heir, co-inheritor with my son, Jesus. There's this verse that says that the will of God is that we would be brothers to Jesus and Jesus first amongst us, right? This is what God desires. The plan of God is that we would be brothers to Jesus and Jesus first among us, right? Like God is all about family. Did you know that? God is all about family. Read, read the beginnings of Genesis and God created everything, heaven, earth, um, and everything was good. Like real good, so good that there's a part in Genesis that says that God looked at creation and said everything is exceedingly good, very good. But then he looked at Adam and he said, no bueno, not good. What was it about Adam that God said no good? He didn't have no family. So God says, you know what? I'm going to make, give him a family, he gives him a wife. Her name was Eve. Right? Then Adam, and he gives him the, the, the word, began to, to multiply and they began to have kids, right? And so, so that God blessed that. He had a family. Let me tell you, this, uh, this is the first uh, Sunday of the month. So today uh, we're going to present babies. And um, last service, uh, there's been a long time since I presented so many babies. I mean, it was like this huge line. And, and I was like, yeah, we're, we're growing the church one baby at a time, right? You know, like, and so God blesses families, right? As a matter of fact, God looked at, at, at the inhabitants of the earth and he chose a family. He, he chose a man named Noah and he saved Noah and his family in the flood. Right? Then years later, God looked at the whole world and he chose another family. He chose a man by the name of Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They were older. They didn't have kids. And he goes, I, I choose that family. And then from their family, they started having, you know, Abraham started having kids and God chooses Isaac. And he goes, I choose Isaac and his family. And then Isaac started having kids, and he goes, okay, I choose Isaac's son, Jacob, and Jacob's family. And that's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And from there, he chose one to bless one particular family, two of them. One were the Levites, and those were the priests, and the others were the, was the, from the uh, tribe of Judah. That's where the kings come from. And, and from that family, he goes, I choose another family. I choose David and his descendants. And, and that's the lineage, the line that Jesus comes from. So if you read the Bible, man, the Bible is all about family. I know there's some people here that you don't like to be around your family. Pray for them. Love them. Right? Be a type of person that your family wants to be around you. Right? You can't control how they are. Right? You don't want to be around them. That's, that's okay. But be the type of family member that your family wants to be around you. All right? Be the family member that your family calls you and says, hey, primo, pray for me. Be the type of family member that the family knows that in need, they can come to you. Oh, pastor, they're just taking advantage of me. That's an opportunity for you to serve them. That's an opportunity for you to lift up the name of Jesus in their lives, right? That's an opportunity for you to glorify God. Don't see it that they're taking advantage of you, right? Be an adult, speak up, right? 
but at the same time, see it as an opportunity to bring honor and glory to God, right? So God has created this family. How does God see us? God sees us as his children, right? Those are the two verses we read. The second question we're going to ask this um, afternoon, how does God see my spouse, right? How does God see my spouse? How does God see my wife? How does God see my husband? Now, let me tell you that if they're saved, if they're walking with the Lord, well, God sees them the way he sees you, right? God sees me as a son. He sees my wife as his daughter, right? But some of you, you're here, and um, maybe uh, this happens. You grew up in church, and the Bible told you, don't be unequally yoked, and you went off and got une unequally yoked, and now you're like, oh, why am I going through all of this stuff? Because <laughs> you, you were disobedient, all right? Some of you, you, you know, you didn't know things about the Lord. And, and you got married, and then somewhere in your marriage, you started seeking God, and you, you started seeking the Lord, and you're coming, but your, your husband or your wife isn't coming, and, and you're praying for them. So, so that's who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about your spouse that's saved. We're talking about having a spouse that's not saved. How does God see them? All right, so from Romans 8, flip a few pages, and we're going to go to Romans 5. And then from Romans 5, we're going to go to the end of the Bible to 1 John chapter 3. So how does God see your unsaved spouse, your unsaved husband, your unsaved wife? And this applies to other things, your unsaved cousin, your unsaved coworker. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Right? Jesus didn't come to die for you after you got it together. Jesus didn't come to die for you after you, you, fix, you fix things in your life. It's funny. I told people, hey, man, come to church. I mean, I'll start going to church, pastor, after I quit drinking. How long have you been trying to quit drinking? Oh, man, like 15 years. Bro, just get to church, man. Stop using, making excuses, right? But I'll go to church when I stop smoking, right? How long have you been trying to quit smoking? Man, I've been trying like 15 years trying to quit smoking. Just stop making excuses. Get to church. Notice that Jesus didn't die after you got your life in order. Jesus died for you before you got your life in order. Right? All right, catch this. Jesus died for you knowing the sins that you were going to commit even after you put your faith in him. Right? Jesus died for you, demonstrated God's love for you, knowing the trip-ups, the mess-ups, right? the, the rebellious times, the strain-away times that were going to occur after You've found his grace and favor and mercy. And even like that, Jesus died for you, right? Why? Why? Notice the first part of this sentence. But God showed his great love for us. Why did Jesus do it? Right? For love. God loves you. Right? God loves you. Look at 1 John 3, verse 1. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that, we, and, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Okay, see how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Right? How does God see your unsaved husband, your unsaved wife, or your unsaved whoever, uh, spouse, family member in your life? God sees them with eyes of love, right? God sees them with love. God sees them with compassion. God sees them with mercy, right? Next time you're arguing and you're, 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 you know, you're, you're bickering at each other and you're, you're picking on each other, just remember, you got red in your eyes. You see them all mad, right? Just remember how God is looking at them, right? God is looking at them with love, with mercy, with compassion, and remember that God expects us right, to be like him, to look like him. Okay, we're going to finish this portion in Matthew chapter 6. So Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6. All right, here's the million-dollar question. How does God see me? God sees me as a son, right? How does God see my spouse? If they're unsaved, God sees them with love, All right? Million-dollar question. How does God expect me to see my spouse, right? How does God expect me to see my wife? If my wife was not saved, was not following the Lord, how does God expect me to see her, right? Your husband, 
he's not saved, he's not serving the Lord, how does God expect you to see him? Well, I mean, I just shared with you that every father's greatest joy is that their child would be like them, right? that, they, that their child would be like them. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love it whenever someone says about Ruth Rose that she's beautiful. I love it when they say Ruth Rose is beautiful. She's so gorgeous. She's such a pretty girl. And um, we were, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm on fumes because um, we left a quick trip to Brownsville and got in late last night and then sermon prep. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of on fumes. But um, I was carrying Ruth Rose and, um, and uh, one of Niley's cousins is, uh, recently had a baby. And, and uh, since um, I've, I've met her husband, I think twice now, two, two or three times. And um, anyways, I was carrying, and, and he looks at Ruth, and he looks at me, and he looks at Ruth, looks at me, and he goes, it's your clone, right? It's your clone, right? And, and man, sh- I love it. Like, the beautiful one is my clone. Man, that, that says something about dad, right? You know, like that. <laughs> I, I love it. Man, you're so compassionate. You know what your heavenly father says? I love it. Man, you're so... You're always showing mercy. You know what your heavenly father says? I love it. Man, you're such a loving person. How, how, do you, how do you love these people that have done you wrong? How do you forgive these people? You know what your heavenly father says? Psh, that's my boy. Right? That's my boy. That's my girl. I'll tell you a quick one. Let me see how much time I have. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Is there was this man. He was a liar. Big time liar. Everybody in town, man. Small town. Big time liar. Everybody knew this. Is big. I mean, he was known. He knew everybody knew he was a liar, and he was known for being a liar. Like it was, it was like the joke of the town. Like now nah, I'm like, ah, man, don't believe anything that dude says, right? That type of guy. And one day, you know, his wife's pregnant, has a, has has a little boy, and the little boy looks nothing like him. And he's like, man, I don't know if this is my kid. And you know, and everybody, you know, you know how the guys are. They start picking on him. Like, man, doesn't look like you. Doesn't look like me. I don't know if that's your kid. And so one day, he's like, man, I need to find out. This is before DNA checking and all that. He's like, I need to find out this is my boy or not. And so they go out to the woods. And he, and he goes, man, I'm going to put this kid to the test, right? And they're out there in the woods, and all of a sudden he says, um, hey, you see that? And the little boy's like, what, Dad, what? He goes, you see that deer? The little boy's looking, and he's like, there's no deer. And the dad's like, oh, man, it's not my kid. And he's like, yeah, mijo, look, look, between those trees, there's a deer. And the little boy's looking, and he's like, no, Dad, like, like, I don't see no deer. And man, the guy starts sweating. He's like, oh man, this ain't my boy, you know, because if he was a boy, he, if it was his son, he'd lie like him, right? And he's like, yeah, look, look between those two trees to the left. Like, there's a deer. And the little boy's looking, looking. He's looking. He goes, man, dad, I don't see no deer, but I can hear the baby deer sucking on his mom. And he's like, oh, that's my boy, right? right that, that right there. That's my boy, right? Like that. <laughs> Let me tell you, every parent wants a little clone. Your heavenly father wants you to look like him. And and the way that you and I came to be a part of the family was through a word called forgiveness. Earlier we sang the song, holy, holy, holy. We sang that God is holy. And I taught you that he's separate from sin. Forgiveness is that God washes those sins away. And this is what Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 says. It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. All right? If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? It's actually here in, in, um, in Matthew chapter 6. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Can you put that for me? Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, Pray like this. Our Father in heaven... May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Now notice this, verse 12. And forgive us, verse 12, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Right? And the Lord's Prayer talks about forgiveness, right? And then you go to verse 14. And it says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. 15, but if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Of all the things in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus comes back and teaches on forgiveness. So it's powerful. Forgiveness is something really 
powerful. I was, as I was prepping for my message, um, I found um, two quotes that I really liked about forgiveness. Um, the first quote I'll share with you, is, it'll be on the screens. Louis B. Smeads was a, a theologian, and he wrote, he says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. So many people, man, they're in a cell. It's a cell of des desire of vengeance. They're in a cell, in a prison cell, and it's a prison cell of bitterness. It's a, it's a, it's a prison cell of, of resentment. And to forgive is to free a prisoner. You're the prisoner. Right? You're the prisoner. Those, those, those walls around you, they're just going to fall when you forgive. Right? Another quote that I really like um, was, forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. Right? Forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. When we don't forgive, man, our future's so narrow. You know, so many of us, we haven't forgiven someone. Some of you haven't forgiven someone. They don't even know. They've moved on with life. And, and you're trapped. So to forgive is to, you can't change the past, but it's to enlarge the future. Let me tell you that um, when you forgive, I want to share three things with you. When you forgive, you are releasing that desire of vengeance. You're releasing bitterness and resentment, right? You're releasing that. And you, I remember as a kid reading the story of this dog, and the dog had a bone, right? And um, one day, that it was a big dog. He had, he had a bone, and he was running, and, and he, he, saw, he saw this, um, this pond, and in the pond, he saw his reflection. He didn't know it was a dog. He didn't know it was a reflection. All what he saw was a bigger dog with a bigger bone. And so they're mad dogging each other, right? What's up, dog? And so he's like, What's, and, you know, so they got this bone, and he's looking at a bigger dog with a bigger bone, and all of a sudden, he decides, I'm going to go for it. And he snaps at that bone, the bigger bone. Well, it was his reflection. So he dropped his bone, right? Because he can only hold on to what? One bone at a time, right? He can only hold on to one at a time. Let me tell you that you have a choice this afternoon. You can hold on to your desire of vengeance. You can hold on to bitterness. You can hold on, hold on to resentment. Or you can let it go and hold on to the love and the grace and the favor and the mercy and the peace and the blessings that God has for you. But you cannot hold on to both, all right? You cannot hold on to both. You let go of one and you grab on the other, all right? You cannot hold on to both. Cho choose the second one, all right? Just in case some of y'all need help, all right? You know, choose the second one. Grab on to God's love, to God's peace, to God's blessings, all right? Um, to, to what God has for you, to God's promises, when you forgive, you release your desire for vengeance, bitterness, and resentment. And you put yourself in a position to receive God's forgiveness. The way you forgive is the way you'll be forgiven. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So when you forgive, you put yourself in a position to receive God's forgiveness. And then the last thing I want to share on this is you leave, when you forgive, you leave the door open for um, reconciliation for restoration, right? For reconciliation and for restoration. So I want to share with you four points on how do I seek forgiveness, right? How do I seek forgiveness? Because many of us have offended, right? Many of us have hurt people, right? Many of us, we, we've wronged someone, right? Don't raise your hands, but if I asked, pretty much all of us should raise our hands, right? There's I think there's only uh, one or two people in this, um, in this room that if I was to ask who has never offended anyone should raise their hands. And that, Chalina Rose would be one of them, right? Rosa, Rosa, Rosalinda Rose would be one of them. And then we have another baby up, up on top, right? So um, all of us, okay. Here, I'm gonna share with you how do you seek forgiveness. First thing is take responsibility. Take responsibility. You hurt someone, you, you did someone harm, you did someone wrong, take responsibility. And let me tell you what is not, what taking responsibility does not look like. Hey, you know, so I know I messed up, but you know you, okay, right there, bro, you, you're not taking responsibility. Right? The moment you said, but you know you, are you too, are you also, right, okay, no, you, you're not taking responsibility, you're picking a fight. 
right? You're not seeking forgiveness, you're picking a fight, right? If you're really seeking forgiveness, you're just going to own up to your part. It's up to them. You can't control other people. You, you know, I, I was, I don't do a lot of counseling, but I was counseling this, this young man one day, and he was um, telling me he, he wanted to get back with, with his, uh, um, his, his I, I don't know if they were married, so I'm, I'm going to say girlfriend, because I don't know. And, um, and so anyways, um, and I was like, well, I'm just listening to him. I'm just trying to be a, a friend listening to him. But then all of a sudden he starts saying, you know, and, you know, she needs to. And, and he started like, I was like, bro, I'm just trying to eat my enchiladas while we're talking. Like, why are you getting mad at me? You know, like, and I was like, you know, well, he's got to take responsibility for his own actions. Right? I have to take responsibilities for my own actions. I, I, I cannot take responsibility for my wife's actions. If she did wrong, may the Lord work in her heart to seek my forgiveness. But if I'm seeking her forgiveness, then I'm just going to take responsibility for what I said, what I didn't say, what I did, what I didn't do, right? The second thing is be remorseful. Um, be repentive. I, you know, there, there used to be this, um, this famous saying. I don't, we don't really hear it that much, but it used to be a, a famous saying. It was even like a famous tattoo. A lot of people even had this, this tattoo. No, um, no regrets. No, what was it? No, no, re, no regrets. If you send the movie, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You know, no regrets, right? No regrets. You know, and people are like, man, should I just live life? No regret. No, no, you know what? We should have regrets. You don't have regrets? Like, we should have regrets. We should be repentful for things. Like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have gone there, right? Um, we should be remorseful. Anybody know how you say remorseful in Spanish? Huh? Redormiento. Oh my goodness. I'm, remordimiento. Remordimiento, right? Remordimiento. Notice the, notice the, the root word, rem, remorder, right? Remorder in Latin, what it means is to bite again, right? It's like to, to gnaw at. Morder, right, is to bite. Re is to do it again. And that's where we get the word remorseful from, from the Latin word, um, that, which the Spanish word is, is closer to it, remordimiento. And, and so if you do wrong, there should be something gnawing at you. That, man, I need to fix this. I need to at least apologize. I need to do my best here, you know, or something. If, if that's not happening in your life, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you with a lot of love. Everybody look right here. If there is no you're not remorseful, you're not repentive, there's no regret in your life, something's seriously wrong with you. I know nobody's ever had the courage to tell you, I only have the courage to tell you because I'm up here and you're down there. <laughs> <laughs> something's seriously wrong with you. The, you know, this is, if the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you will feel remorseful. You will be led to repentance. You will understand, hey, this is wrong and I have to take responsibility for my own actions. The third thing I want to share with you is seek restoration and reconciliation. Right? Seek to reconcile that relationship. Seek to restore that relationship. Right? Seek restoration and reconciliation. That doesn't mean that you're always going to walk together again. Right? There's some things that, man, it's such a divide that there can be forgiveness, but that doesn't mean that, that you're, you're going to walk with that person forever and ever, be happily ever after. Maybe, praise the Lord, if that happens. Gloria a Dios if that happens. But there's some things that, man, there's some, some people just, you know, it's a bad chemistry that is so toxic that you're better off just keeping the cross in between you. You know, leave room for Jesus. But seek restoration, seek reconciliation. This is, this is God's ministry. Everybody here has ministry, right? Well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not one of the singers. I'm not, you know, everybody here has a ministry. You know what's the ministry? It's the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus came that we would be reconciled with the Father. Right? We were prodigal sons. We were prodigal daughters. We're out there. We're lost. We're, we're partying up. We're living in Vegas. Right? What, what's the nickname for, for Vegas? Sin City, man. We were doing Sin City in Houston and Pasadena. We, we didn't have to go to Vegas. We're doing it here. Right? And even like that, Jesus came and died for us, even in our sins, right? Why? To reconcile us to the Father. Right? There's a false doctrine and this false doctrine is called universalism. And universalism says, like, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Like, as long as you're sincere in what you believe and you believe, like, in a higher power, like, you know, everything's going to be okay. We'll all be in heaven. That's, that's, 
You think that the Son of God left heaven, left the throne in heaven to be placed in a manger? You think the Son of God left streets of gold to come and walk on dirt roads? You think that the Son of God came and left the adoration of heaven to come to his own and be rejected so that at the end he could be one of many options? <laughs> nah, Papa. It don't work like that. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say, I am one way of many. I'm one truth, and whatever's true for you is, is great, and whatever's true for me, like, you know, uh, pick your life. No, no, he didn't say that. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came with the sole purpose to bring reconciliation between us. You read uh, the story of Adam and Eve. God came in the cool of the day to talk to them. He had fellowship with them. But because of their sin, God is like, get them out of here. Okay? But then he restores that relationship through the seed of Eve, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay. Fourth thing I want to share with you, and go ahead and pull out your cell phones, take a picture of this so you can meditate on this during the week. Pray for renewal. Right? Pray for renewal. How do I seek forgiveness? Well, pray that God would change you, right? That there would be renewal, something new happening in your life, something new happening in that person's life, that they would be healed and that they would be renewed, right? Pray for renewal, right? Pray for, for renewal. And um, I'll, I'll tell you that this is, this is really important, you know? Uh, there's, a, there's a part in the um, in book of Revelation where Jesus is talking to the believers, and he says, go back to your first love, right? Go back to your first love. Some of you, you're seeking forgiveness from your, you know, with your wife, with your husband. Go, go back to how it used to be, right? Wives, you know, the, the Pueblo's church may not apply so much because you're, you're really young in this service. This is the youngest service. But, you know, sometimes, you know, whenever, um, when, when, when y'all were first, you know, glancing at each other, when y'all were first giving googly eyes, wives, when you were first looking at him, you know, like trying to give him the hint of I'm interested, right? And um, you'd get all dolled up. You'd get your hair done and your nails done. And, um, and you know, he would say something and you would laugh. It wasn't funny, but you would laugh like, oh, you're so funny, right? And he would say something. He's probably dumb as rocks, but you're like, oh, you're so smart, right? You're so smart, right? You know? Well... Uh, now, now what? After five years of marriage, 10 years of marriage, four huecos, you know, four kids and stuff, and now, now, they, you, my mom was right. You know, good for nothing. Like, really, go, pray for renewal. <laughs> pray for renewal. Go back to your first love. Go back to how I was, you know. Guys, the same thing, guys. You're not off the hook, right? I mean, I, you know I'm, I'm team husband. You know Pastor Reuben is team husband. You know Pastor Reuben is team, team man. But, but come on, man, we can't be, be off the hook either. I'll tell you what. We're dating. I never bought my wife flowers. Because I, I don't want her when we're married to be like, you, you used to buy me flowers. I never buy her flowers, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You used to buy her flowers. When's the last time you bought her flowers? Right? You used to randomly, you know, send her message. I, I randomly text my wife. T-A-M, right? In Spanish, y'all know, te amo mucho, right? My, my wife, she's the type that she likes to make lists. Like, she, she makes a grocery list. She has a notebook. She makes a grocery list. And uh, I'll, I'll grab her notebook. She's not looking. And, and like, 10 pages later, I'll write, I love you, you know, like that. And so one day, she'll get there to make the grocery list, and all of a sudden, she'll see this random note from me, right, that says, I, I love you, right? That's the type of stuff I used to do when we were dating, You used to send her notes. You used to, um, you used to say her cooking was good. Because it was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, go back, pray, pray, God, bring renewal. Bring renewal, all right? So that's how we seek forgiveness. All right, last thing as we prepare to finish up. How do I forgive? This is really powerful because I'm going to tell you, there are people that are suffering physically. They're suffering physically because they haven't been able to forgive. And, and that resentment and that um, bitterness and that desire for vengeance is physically taking a toll on you, all right? So uh, 
How do we forgive? How do we, how do we forgive? First of all, we need to remember that God has forgiven us, right? God has forgiven us, right? And some, some of us screwed up really royally, right? Some of us screwed up big time, right? And even like that, God is like, you know what, mijo? I still want you to be part of the family. You know what, mija? I want you to come in, be a part of the family, right? Some of us, we've screwed up royally. Some of us have screwed up big time. I put myself in this category. After we've put our faith in Jesus, right? I've screwed up royally, big time, after I put my faith in Jesus. And now you, you, you enjoy the forgiveness of God in your life. Oh. Just like God forgave you, right? you need to forgive too. Right? Second thing I share with you is bring the offense to their attention. How many times, how many times, I don't mean to pick on the women, but this happens a lot with women. Your husband will do something wrong, and instead of talking to him, you go and you tell the primas first. You tell your cousins first. Instead of talking to him, you go and tell all your coworkers first. Instead of talking to him, you go tell all your friends first. Right? He has no idea that he messed up. He has no idea that he offended you. He has no idea that, that your, your feelings are hurt. Bring it to their attention. Jesus says that when someone has offended you, go and talk to them. If they don't listen, take a witness with you. Then if they don't listen, he says, bring them before the church. Some people want to put them on blast. Some people, instead of just saying, hey, you know what, when you did this, no, instead they'll post. Some people, they'll post something online like, some people, you know, they need to learn, you know. <laughs> they have no idea. Bring, it, bring the offense to their attention. Third thing. Follow the example of Jesus. Follow the example of Jesus. You know, this isn't about Jesus, but this, this is because I mentioned social media. Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. He knows it ain't his. And the Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man, and he wanted to quietly put Mary aside. He, he didn't try and blast her on social media. I think we can learn from that 2024. Amen. Right? We can learn from that, okay? But follow the example of Jesus. Think about it. Jesus, innocent. He's backstabbed, sold out by a friend. He's arrested. He's beaten. They pull on his beard, put a crown of thorns on him. He's disrobed, like they leave him naked. They crucify him. Crucifixion, the death of crucifixion is so horrible, so horrible that the Jews could not crucify a fellow Jew. They didn't crucify no one. That's why they sent them to the Romans. And the Romans wouldn't crucify a Roman citizen. Right? That's how horrible crucifixion was. And then Jesus is on the cross, dying a horrible, slow, torturous, painful death. And he shares seven sayings, seven words, the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. One of the sayings, he cries out, Father! Send the angels and get them. No, he didn't say that. You need to read your Bible. He says, Father, let lightning fall on them. Tostitos. No, he didn't say that either. Anybody know what Jesus said when he was on the cross? He cries out to Father. He says, Father, somebody help me out. Forgive them. Forgive them. You're Christian? Follow Jesus. You have forgiveness? Forgive. You have the mind of Jesus. You have the spirit of Jesus. You're part of the body of Jesus. Follow the example of Jesus. Right? In the hardest, most difficult of moments, Jesus says, forgive. I forgive them. Father, you forgive them. You forgive. All right, last one. Go ahead and take a picture of this. Pray for the person who has wronged you. Right? This is how you're going to know that you've truly forgiven someone. You can bless them. Here's how you know you've truly forgiven someone. You heard that, that they received a blessing and you're happy about it. Right? That's how you'll know you truly have forgiven someone. When you see someone that has wronged you and they prosper or something good happens in their life and you're like, good for them. If we were friends on Facebook, if we were friends on Facebook, I would like it. <laughs> Pray for them. Pray for the person who has wronged you. Pray for, that's, that's powerful right there. In the, in, the, in the act of, in the, in, the, in the healing process of forgiveness, to be able to pray for someone who has wronged you, 
God healed them. Healed them. Right? And that, that's really powerful. Bless them. God bless them. Yeah. Not, not like us Southerners. Bless your soul. No, not like that. Not like that, right? <laughs> not like us Southerners, right? <laughs> you're, not, you're not from the South. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyways, go watch Sweet Home Alabama if you want. And so, um, no, no, no. Bless them. God, I pray that you bless them. Bless, bless their marriage. Bless their kids. Bless their finances. Bless their health. Bless them by saving them. I was thinking about this last night, and just because of time, I don't want to share too much about this, but Jonah, you know, the, the, the story of Jonah in the, in the big fish, he didn't want to go preach where God was sending him to preach because those were the enemies. And he's like, I don't want to go to Nineveh because they're going to repent and God's going to forgive them. Like, he wanted God to destroy them. He's a preacher, he's a pastor, he's a prophet. He's like, I don't want to go. It was like, man, just drop lightning on them, you know, do a Sodom and Gomorrah on them, you know. That, that, that's what he wanted. He had to get in, that, in that, that fish. After three days in that fish, he was like, you know what? I'm better off forgiving them and allowing God to forgive them, right? Forgive is powerful. All right, I want to invite you to bow your head. And will you begin to thank God that you came to church today? Say, thank you, Father, that I came to church your family is here, will you thank God that your family is here? Say, Father, I thank you that my family is here at church with me. Thank you, Lord. Gracias, Señor. Thank you. Father, we thank you that you are here with us. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Did you wrong someone? And you long for their forgiveness? Know that your heavenly Father forgives you. Did you wrong someone and you have yet to even seek their forgiveness? That's not what your heavenly Father wants. Were you wronged? And you're having a hard time to forgive, you're having a hard time to let go of. God's got bigger and better things than bitterness for you. Jesus died on the cross to give you bigger and better things than the desire of vengeance or, the, or resentment. In Jesus, you are promised a peace that surpasses all understanding. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. They're family members and you don't know what they did to me. They were supposed to take care of me. You don't know what they did to me. She said, till death do us part. He said, till death do us part. And you don't know what she did. You don't know what he did. I don't know. But I know that if you hold on to the desire of vengeance and bitterness and resentment, you're never going to heal. And you'll never be able to Enjoy the blessings that God has for you or the peace that surpasses all understanding that God has for you. But the first step you have to take is to receive God's forgiveness because just like you, they wronged you, you've wronged God. And God wants to heal you, but first he wants to forgive you. Is there anyone present today that would say, I need God's forgiveness in my life? I want to invite you, just in an act of faith, just raise your hand and then you can put it down. Say, I need God's forgiveness in my life. I see you on my left hand side. God bless you. Here in the middle, God bless you. On my right, God bless you. Up in the balcony, God bless you guys. God bless you. I want to invite everyone to pray together. Will, will you repeat this prayer with me? Everyone, let's, let's pray together. Will you say, Father God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that 2,000 years ago, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, to be buried, and to resurrect so that today I could receive your blessings, your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace. Father, I ask that you would help me to seek forgiveness of those I have wronged and help me to forgive those who have wronged me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence.
Fill me with that peace that surpasses all understanding. Father God, I put Pueblo's church in your hands. I ask that your grace, your favor, your mercy, your blessings would be over them. That you would heal the brokenhearted, Lord. That you would bring the brokenhearted, Father, healing and restoration. That they would leave here today strengthened, blessed, encouraged, all in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise.